kind of incredible to have this opportunity to talk to you today, both you know in the spirit of Dan's legacy and then with the other speakers who are um, sharing the podium both yesterday and today. Um, so here we go. Um, Boston is a very famous deadpan comedian called Stephen Wright, and Stephen has a joke I am, uh, have always been very fond of. He says, and I'm gonna do my best impression, you can't have everything, where would you put it? <laughs> So my role today is to give perspective from special collections and archives within the research library as we consider the future of library collections writ large. Although I work increasingly in a library context, my professional roots are as an archivist, as if I thought more and more about what I might contribute to our discussion today that won't be represented elsewhere, I found myself returning to archival appraisal. I recognize that archival appraisal theory has not been a fashionable topic, um, of late, and uh, that there may be some misunderstanding and misconception about it. So I'm entering this territory with a little bit of trepidation. Um, but I will ask that you trust me as I venture into this valley, as I argue that uh, archival appraisal theory can contribute to our thinking about research library collections as a whole in the, area of, in the era of the collective collections. We need to address the main concerns raised and confronted by archival appraisal as the research library pivots more directly towards special collections and archives, a trend I will also discuss at some length. So very early in the education of an archivist, one learns something counterintuitive. The theory and practice of archives are not about saving records as much as they are about acknowledging and managing loss. When considering the universe of published materials, vast and growing as it may be, it's not difficult to imagine a network of libraries capturing and preserving almost every work. Now consider for a moment the totality of human experience recorded every moment of every day, traditionally in letters, diaries, photographs, home movies, and many other forms, and more recently in email, digital documents, photographs, video, social media, websites, it goes on and on. All individuals, families, groups, communities, governments, and institutions create and accumulate these records, and the proliferation of new devices has been accompanied by an inconceivable volume of recorded information. How do we make decisions about what should be acquired and preserved over the long run? Which records are most important and why? I'm personally grateful to live in an era in which social history, cultural history, and other intellectual, socio-political, and professional turns, including recently the dialogue around community archives and documenting the now, have challenged us to consider how we ensure the documentary record represents the greatest diversity of human experience and empowers the broadest set of individuals and groups. But how do we do all this while working within the constraints of the resources we can bring to this endeavor? These questions are difficult because the blunt truth is that not all documentation of human experience can or even should be kept for posterity, let alone be made available for research. The South African archivist Vern Harris has described the archival endeavor as a sliver of a sliver of a sliver, by which he means that only a sliver of human experience becomes part of the documentary record to begin with, of which only a sliver can be captured by an archive or library, of which only a sliver will enjoy unlimited preservation lifespan, along with more than a partial treatment that will afford true discovery and access. So the fundamental objective of archives lies in employing judgment to the selection of the relatively small percentage of records that can be preserved into perpetuity. Articulating mission in this way tends to be more prosaic than romantic. When one emphasizes how a potential acquisition of personal papers, for instance, fits into an articulated strategy and policy, weighing opportunity cost as much as opportunity, runs the risk of appearing technocratic. The best curators, archivists, and special collections librarians work with inspiration and an even temperament to balance an intense passion for adding materials to collections with an understanding of the costs and responsibilities of stewardship and the life cycle of information. Responsibly saying yes to some collections requires us to say no to others, even those that could prove important for scholarship and teaching one day. So archival appraisal theory has been debated and developed formally over the course of at least the past century as a way to help us with this fundamental problem. A full review of this thinking would extend well beyond the boundaries of this talk, but I offer the following quick overview as a way to situate a discussion of how archival appraisal theory can apply to today's environment. 
One can think about the history of appraisal as boiling down to two schools of thought with competing first principles. They get at the fundamental question of whether archivists should be passive receivers or active shapers of the documentary record of society. Sir Hilary Jenkinson was probably the first advocate for the idea of the objectivity of the archival record, wherein the archives and archivists should be passive receivers and neutral custodians of the records offered to them by records creators and the organizations they serve. While on a theoretical level, these ideas have fallen out of favor, in practice, this tradition is alive and well and can be commonly seen to justify acquisition decisions in many different contexts. A common expression of this keeper mentality might be, who are we to say what future researchers would find, will find relevant, leading us to receive all acquisitions opportunities that come along and preserve them at all cost. One also still hears arguments that archives are neutral spaces and, more importantly, many of our processes and products obscure the reality that judgment, whether passive or active, underlies so much of what we do. So beginning with Theodore Schellenberg in the 1950s, a second tradition bloomed, designed to give archivists tools and concepts for navigating an era of records abundance rather than scarcity. During the period between the 1970s through the 1990s, we experienced a golden age of appraisal theory in which it became generally accepted that appraisal was archives' most important function. Much of this work was exhorted by Gerald Hamm, who led off his 1974 presidential address to the Society of American Archivists with the following. Our most important and intellectually demanding task as archivists is to make an informed selection of information that will provide the future with a representative record of human experience in our time but why must we do it so badly? Is there any other field of information gathering that has such a broad mandate with a selection process so random, so fragmented, so uncoordinated, and even so accidental? That's a close quote. At least in part, Ham's provocation sparked two decades where archival appraisal was at the forefront of writing and thinking in the field. So it was a romantic period of archives during which professional thinkers and leaders were obsessed with why records were important in trying to develop big ideas and practices that would help us embrace a more active role in shaping the documentary record and tackle the central and very difficult questions. What records should be acquired and kept for posterity? Which records in an archive should be kept, processed, and preserved, and to what level? More recently, this can be applied to what do we digitize and why? Many of these ideas assumed an institutional archive setting, making them less relevant to repositories collecting archival documentation from other parties through gift and purchase, but some theories deserve some passing reference. Functional analysis and its Canadian cousin macro appraisal stress understanding the various functions and structures of an institution, an organization, or even a community or individual, and making value judgments about documentation based on these functions before or even in place of looking at the content of records themselves. The strategy enables an archivist within an institutional setting to navigate more effectively an immense volume of records that cannot be read and ass assessed individually. Macro appraisal further urges the archivist to value what Terry Cook called hot spots, valuing areas of conflict and disagreement within society and culture. Documentation strategy takes as its starting point that individual institutions cannot possibly take on the role of documenting society on their own and that the only possible way of accomplishing this is through cooperation. This theory provides an idealistic but compelling vision for interinstitutional collaboration, for documenting a particular subject, reason, or other area, also incorporating the expertise of users of archives into the process. As a way of getting institutions away from what David Gracie termed the vacuum cleaner approach to acquisitions, collection policies uh, were borrowed from libraries and emerged and persist as a method for articulating the goals of a repository's program, considering institutional mission, types of programs and users supported by the collection, resources available to effectively steward the collection, and the external environment, which explicitly compels us to consider the work of other institutions in a given area. An articulated policy provides a framework for proactive outreach to various individuals, organizations, and communities to discover and acquire records and very often to refuse offers of materials that, that do not fit in it. This last point is key. In fact, in that refusing a potential acquisition or more radically, deaccessioning materials that do not fit into a repository's policy often represents a source of conflict and misunderstanding between archivists and librarians working within a broader research library context. 
Frank Bowles believes these theories reached their zenith in the mid-90s with the development of Mark Green and Todd Daniels Howell's Minnesota Method, which blended portions of all of the above work into a single framework of measured steps and actions used to pursue and appraise the records of the business sector in the state of Minnesota. And this work has been applied to help guide other challenging areas of appraisal practice, such as uh, the papers of university faculty. Although not necessarily articulated explicitly as archival appraisal theory, we've seen recently the very promising development of theory and practice surrounding community archives. Michelle Caswell writes that community-based archives serve as an alternative venue for communities to make collective decisions about what is of enduring value to them to shape collective memory on, of their own pasts and to control the means through which stories about their past are constructed. These are essentially appraisal activities, and the growth of community-based archives provide at once an opportunity for broadening the range of documentary resources that can be preserved, along with a critique and an acknowledgement of the limitations of archival repositories, which benefit from and are beset by the power dynamics of the institutions in which they are situated. The theories of archival appraisal covered here embrace the idea that choices need to be made regarding materials to be accessioned into the archive and acknowledge the powerful and active role we play in this process. Appraisal theory posits that serious forethought about a repository's collecting goals documented in a policy provides a necessary framework for decisions about what we actively pursue, what we passively acquire, and what we turn down or deaccession at later stages, balancing with the resources necessary to appropriately steward collections. In the grand dream, these policies could join with other repositories to make an overall map that will document society in its broadest sense. Okay, so there are two reasons. I spent the first part of my talk this morning engaging with the concepts and history of archival appraisal. It wasn't to torture you. Um, <laughs> First, many of these concepts are directly relevant to the current moment research libraries. As I've waded into collections issues outside of archives and rare book and manuscript libraries, I see a familiar challenge, the tension of abundance and scarcity. In terms of abundance, there's more, archive, or there's more libraries could potentially collect, either alone or collaboratively, than any program could hope to reasonably capture. In using phrases such as a tsunami of data, Dan Hazen described this dynamic well in the 2009 article we read for the symposium. We've seen an explosion of the digital, as well as traditional print, and received feedback from our patrons that they wish for us to have both print and electronic copies of books, and they want to have local access. While there's an abundance in what we could potentially collect, we're operating within the limits of our resources, whether collection budgets, or the staff required to steward collections, or we've often seen reductions in recent years. That is to say, we could describe the current collections context as one in which there's growing misalignment between our appetite to collect and our ability to do so. This context echoes the abundance and scarcity dialectic archivists have faced for decades, leading me to reconsider archival appraisal theory and suggest that it offers an especially useful and compelling framework for the current collections environments in general and special collections alike. Greg Yao has made the same point in viewing shared print management within the IV Plus network as fundamentally an archival appraisal challenge. As we abandon the ideas of the comprehensive collection once and for all, while at the same time expand the types of materials we acquire, preserve, and make accessible, we need methodologies for decision making. The second reason I've focused on archival appraisal is because I would like to establish and develop a shared understanding of what we are trying to do with rare and unique materials as we venture into a new era for research library collections in which archives and special collections play a more central role in the overall endeavor. I would like to suggest that there are commonalities and convergences between general collections and special collections and archives, and we need to think through these opportunities and challenges if we are to contemplate working more closely and harmoniously across these communities and traditions. Before exploring this convergence between general and special collections, I draw this dichotomy a bit sheepishly, um, and especially at a symposium in honor of Dan. Um, it's like very clear that Dan reveled in uh, exploring complexity, and um, so I'm simplifying in this context, and I, um, and I want you to forgive me for that, um, but I'm using terms such as general, special, and archival collections as abstractions in order to make an argument that the missions of these traditionally separate parts of the library are beginning to move more closely together. And I'm by no means the first to make this argument that archives and special collections have moved from the margins to the center of the research library. 
you know, we heard about this yesterday. Sarah Thomas has argued convincingly that special collections have moved from Siberia to Shangri-La within the research libraries, writing, special collections were once marginal and elitist. Now they're at the heart of what we do, and they're opening and welcoming. ARL, the ARL Working Group on Special Collections has put a heightened emphasis on the importance of special collections, writing, in an environment where mass digitization of books and periodicals for web access is accelerating, and electronic journals and aggregated databases are part of the shared landscape of scholarly communication, it is their accumulated special collections that increasingly define the uniqueness and character of individual research libraries. Rick Anderson has posited a general shift away from what he calls commodity collections to rare and unique materials traditionally housed in special collections. Thomas Hickerson has compelled us to incorporate special collections, staffing, and expertise into the common asset base of the library. Following this compulsion, ARL produced an entire issue of research library issues on mainstreaming special collections, which explores different case studies of activities that bring rare and unique materials and those with the expertise to work with them into the work of the library as a whole. Rare and unique holdings comprise an important part of Lurkin Dempsey's concept of the inside out collection. And I would call it, I think he said um, that collections are becoming specialer. Did I have that yeah, um, yesterday? So um, we see a reflection there as well. And um, in short, a consensus has emerged that we need to be putting more resources into special collections and seeing them as central to the future of the research library as a whole. Less has been written on this movement in the archives and special collections literature specifically, although at least two recent publications have shared archival theory and practices as key lessons for libraries facing new challenges and opportunities. Megan Sniffen Marinoff, Donna Weber, and Jeanette Bastian have recently published an important and very relevant monograph, Archives and Libraries, What Librarians and Archivists Need to Know in Order to Work Together. In addition, Jackie Dooley's OCLC research report, The Archival Advantage, Integrating Archival Expertise in the Management of Born Digital Library Materials highlights 10 areas where archival expertise can be harnessed by research libraries navigating the complex set of variables necessary when working in, with new forms of digital content that diverge from print analogs. These writings suggest a future where the missions and approaches of special and general collections can, be poor, can become more closely aligned in more productive ways. In addition, special collections and archives have adopted perspective and outlook more traditionally associated with general collections over the past generation. We've seen a shift in how we value our collections. Rather than defining our libraries and our departments solely or primarily by what we have, we now see an emphasis on how they can be used. Extensive efforts have been placed in processing backlogs, digitizing holdings, and other activities designed to promote broad access to collections. More importantly, archives and special collections now see outreach and instruction as a central part of our mission. Undergraduates increasingly find a home in archives and special collections with staff driven to help them find materials, formulate research questions and topics, and understand the power of primary source research and experiential learning. At Houghton, I often trot out the statistic that we're hosting three times as many undergraduates in their courses than we did even, even a decade ago. And we've even begun to incentivize the use of special collections and archives on the undergraduate level. Over the course of the past two summers, we funded and hosted nine undergraduate research fellows to complete their own projects with the hopes that they would serve as ambassadors to their peers to invite even more students into our midst. And we are nearing completion of a publication targeted at undergraduates that highlights ways each of the 49 concentrations at Harvard can utilize Houghton collections to further their studies. Archives and special collections conferences and publications are filled with presentations, sessions, and articles that report on similar initiatives in other settings. The zeal with which we are promoting access, outreach, and instruction looks and feels much more like a general collections approach than something our predecessors, who focused their energies to a greater degree on the advanced researcher, would have recognized or likely supported. When sharing an earlier draft of this paper with my colleague Christine Weideman, who's the Director of Manuscripts and Archives Department at Yale, she pointed out to me the various areas in access services, cataloging, archival processing, metadata creation, preservation, teaching, and administration, in which she sees convergence between archives and special collections in the main research library, highlighting this shift as the most important transition she has seen over the past generation. 
So, despite these ongoing transitions, there continue to be differences between general and special collections, and these differences, which most saliently occur in collections development and stewardship, present serious barriers that we need to thoughtfully address and work through if we are to continue to bridge our traditional gaps. These differences matter in that while we have theorized and actualized some convergence of mission and activities, they can serve as a source of ongoing misunderstanding and even frustration. At heart, I would identify three concerns where friction remains. First is a lingering aspiration for comprehensiveness. Two is the degree to which awareness of life cycle costs have been incorporated in the selection process. And three, it's how we value partner, how we view partner institutions. Again, oversimplifying for rhetorical purposes, the traditional collection development goal within the general collections at the major research libraries was comprehensiveness, to build piece by piece collections of record that contain or at least aspire to contain the full printed record of human endeavor. While even at Harvard, we've moved away from the goal to have everything. We still want to build broad and deep local collections that support the wide ranging and diverse research interests of all of our faculty and students. Since these interests are voracious, we have generally believed more is better. Even in vestige form, these approaches do not map, map as well on special collections and archives, where the approach to building and stewarding collections is significantly different. Building broad and comprehensive collections has never been the goal, but rather to build strategically and selectively, at times working to tremendous depth, but without the assumption we can or should cover all bases. This represents less of a concern when it comes to rare books and manuscripts acquired individually or in small allotments, but can be more challenging in the areas of ephemera collections, collections compiled by collectors that we later acquire, and especially modern archives, which all have significant stewardship costs. Speaking of stewardship, in the general collections tradition, the acquisition decision tends to be a one-time activity. Although bringing collections and technical services staff more closely together in administrative structures, has become more common, there often exists a division between those bibliographers who make selection decisions and those responsible for the full stewardship life cycle that includes preservation, access, and, disport, and support of research and teaching using collections. While curators or archivists who make an acquisitions decision may or may not be personally responsible for the work of preserving, arranging, describing, or providing frontline reference for a collection, the best of them internalize that the decision to acquire a collection or archive represents only the first and often the easiest part of a series of activities necessary to ensure it can be effectively preserved and used. The underlying assumption for a curator is that he or she has broad oversight responsibility for collections in their area. At minimum, they contribute expertise to processing and cataloging, as well as judgment to conservation and preservation decisions, expert research and teaching support for faculty, students, and other researchers who need it, and interpretive activities in the form of exhibitions and publications when necessary or opportune. While certainly standard approaches are utilized, rare book cataloging and archival processing usually has to counter the unexpected, and judgment of individual archivists and catalogers must be employed on a regular basis to navigate appraisal decisions and appropriate levels of arrangement, description, and preservation. While we've made remarkable progress processing hidden collections over the past decade, many repositories still carry significant backlogs. Moreover, especially with gifts, but also with some purchases, curators take on a long-term relationship with an individual, organization, or estate seeking to transfer collections to a repository. Like all human relationships, these can be complex and time-consuming with ups and downs and require us to consider longer-term implications on our time and psyche with every decision. All of this work can be labor intensive and I fear adding more individuals with a mandate to acquire collections without careful acknowledgement of and planning for growth will, will create a new era of backlogs filled with records of uneven value. Finally, a note about competition versus collaboration. In general collections, we traditionally looked at holdings at peer institutions in a competitive rather than complementary way with the collecting goal traditionally being not to hold all of the volumes at peer institutions, but to go above and beyond this to have the largest collections. ARL rankings have traditionally incentivized this model, whereby the strength of collections was measured by the sheer, sheer size and scope of our collections and materials budgets. We have, of course, seen powerful use cases of collaboration on the collections front. Um, and I think we heard, I did, I'm not talking about area studies today, but I think like, that was a really important point made yesterday. 
Um, in, in addition to networks of interlibrary loan, the borrow direct lending service within IV Plus, and the whole concept of the collective collection provides an inspiring collaborative vision. I'm concerned, however, that when we discuss the turn to conceiving of a research library special collections and archives as the way we distinguish our collections from one another, we will advance in a needlessly competitive way. While size and scope are often used as bragging rights in special collections and archives, we traditionally also build collections with a keen awareness of those at peer institutions. And again, I, um, referring back to what Lorcan was talking about yesterday, I think he referred to this as conscious coordination. I've spent much of this paper considering archives, but I'd like to use an example of rare book acquisitions to illustrate this principle. Rare book acquisitions are increasingly informed by searches often provided by dealers in their catalogs to determine which if any other libraries own a copy of a specific volume. While this is partially motivated by a desire to distinguish one libra one's library from others, it can also be seen as a collaborative gesture to spend one's own resource to add to the overall corpus of materials we preserve and make available. It is not uncommon for a curator at one institution to refer an item to another where it may have a better home, and in fact, this behavior reflects principles articulated in the very first tenet of the Society of American Archivists Code of Ethics, which explicitly encourages us to cooperate and collaborate with other archivists and respect them in their institutions, missions, and collecting policies. Following these ethics can be a challenging endeavor, especially when tempted by a valuable opportunity and or pressured by local concerns attracted by the prestige and utility of a specific acquisition. And our landscape is littered with examples of collections split between repositories. The marketplace can breed competition as well, when it can be a common to participate in auctions that involve peer institutions, dealers, and private collectors. And certainly there are areas such as the archives of and collections related to writers, artists, and other public figures whose pursuit can be characterized by competition rather than collaboration. Though I would say that as prices for these continue to skyrocket, one wonders whether a more collaborative approach in these arenas would be better for all as well. While we would probably not want to eliminate competition entirely, even if it were possible, we should define these areas as exceptions to the rules for coll of collaboration. We selectively and strategically build collections that acknowledge our part in, in a larger constellation of collecting institutions for another important reason. External users of archives and special collections have always been encouraged to utilize these holdings. For instance, at Houghton, roughly two-thirds of researchers in our reading room over the past year had no Harvard affiliation. We sometimes harbor concerns that our own faculty don't make enough use of collections at home and that we may come under pressure from short-sighted administrators taking an our, uni our university first perspective. But these concerns pale in the understanding that our repositories exist within a broad network supporting scholarship in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. When we host a scholar from Yale studying transcendentalist literature, we know Yale will welcome our faculty and students to study the Harlem Renaissance. And in fact, many libraries and archives have developed research fellowships designed to support travel to encourage these uses of our collections. This focus on serving internal and external audience represents another way in which archives and special collections model an inside out approach to collections. We should be prepared to deflect collections of materials that do not fit into local frameworks with the confidence that other repositories can find a good home. These three areas, embracing the need for selection, thinking collaboratively with other institutions, and fully weighing and understanding the long-term stewardship costs of special collections and archives represent the way forward for more general collections to participate in the enhanced acquisition of archives and special collections materials. Success in this endeavor will give us a greater impact on research, teaching, and learning on campus, and to the preservation and understanding of cultural heritage now and into perpetuity. Within this framework, the convergence of general and special collections can be seen as a healthy and welcome transformation. More importantly, our divergences are not intractable, but opportunities to learn from each other and create a holistic view of the collective collection. Engaging the resources and manpower of the general library and archives and special collections work will allow us to work at a greater scale and impact and help build capacity for processing, cataloging, preservation, digitization, reference, and instruction. The moment calls for us all, general collections and special collections alike, to have open and honest conversations about what we are trying to achieve with our collecting program overall, set goals, and build strategies. We should develop broader policy frameworks and rationale for the areas we will and will not cover and work proactively and strategically to execute them. 
I would like to consume, con, uh, I would like to conclude with a final concern and an opportunity, returning to the themes in the earlier part of this paper. With the discourse around community archives a notable exception, questions of archival appraisal have faded in prominence over the past two decades. This ebb in appraisal theory has corresponded with the greatest explosion of recorded information in the history of humanity, and I fear we have abandoned appraisal theory at a time when we most needed it. Not only have the ubiquity of personal computers, laptops, smartphones, and other devices enabled unprecedented creation of records in volume and of type, we've also seen a period where the laser printer, photocopier, and other technologies have created more paper records than ever before. The challenges of the digital age have created circumstances where we desperately need appraisal theories to be developed for the new era. Perhaps a rebirth of appraisal can be something we work on within the context of a new era of research library activity in which special collections and archives become the part of the core and not on the fringe. Thank you. Good morning. I'm honored to have this opportunity to talk, uh, to as serve as a respondent to Tom's talk. And I first want to thank him for a very thoughtful, informative, and substantive analysis of the role of special collections and what we can learn from them for the research library as a whole. There's so much we could discuss, but I'll comment briefly on three topics from Tom's talk, raising questions both for him and for all of us. First topic, how central are special collections? Tom states that archives and special collections have moved from the margins into the center of the research library. Later, he mentions that special collections and archives have adopted perspectives formally associated with general collections, encouraging undergraduate use and seeing outreach and instruction as central to their mission. I agree with this observation about openness and use. These changes have developed over the past 25 or so years and are now well established. In this sense, with regard to the place of special collections in teaching and learning, special collections have indeed become more central to the research library. But is this true with respect to our library's collection development activities and budgets? In the 2009 paper by Dan Hazen that Tom and others have referenced, Dan stated that, quote, Harvard users will ultimately be best served if the library focuses as much as possible on specialized materials and primary sources and that the proportion of collections funds allotted to primary resources and special collections materials will build slowly from the levels typical of the recent past. Has this happened at Harvard? I hope Tom will tell us. Is it happening at your libraries? I hope some of you will tell us. Uh, at Duke, I would say that we have been intentionally increasing the proportion of the collections budget used for special collections, both from our university appropriated funds and from gifts and endowments but still only four to five percent of our collections expenditures are devoted to special collections and perhaps 10 to 12 percent of our workforce. So special collections are certainly important to us, but is this what we mean by central to the overall endeavor or is that transition still to come? Second topic, is the expanded role of special collections a convergence of interest or a friendly takeover or both? <laughs> In, his in the conclusion of his talk, Tom speaks of, quote, opportunities to learn from each other and create a holistic view of the collective collection. That sounds like a convergence of interests. He also states that, quote, engaging the resources and manpower of the general library in archives and special collections work will allow us to work at a greater scale and impact, help build capacity for processing, cataloging, preservation, digitization, reference, and instruction. Quote, I think for special collections. That sounds to me a bit like a friendly takeover. Third topic, how useful are the particular archival concepts that Tom described for managing general collections? Both Tom and Dan have called attention to the sheer quantity of recorded information now being produced. Tom states that there is more that libraries could potentially collect, either alone or collaboratively, than we have the resources to capture and preserve. Some of you may wish to maintain that we can, or at least that we should keep everything, or as much of it as possible, because we cannot know what will be studied and valued in the future. If this is your perspective, I hope you will speak up and challenge Tom on this point. But in my view, Tom is correct. 
In the expanded world of digital information, we need to manage loss, and we need, to, we need help in understanding what to collect and what not to collect. So I appreciate Tom's elucidation of the ways in which archivists have scoped their collecting activities using various approaches to archival appraisal. It is not clear to me, however, whether Tom would recommend the use of the particular concepts he describes. He says that many of the concepts, uh, quote, are directly relevant to the current moment in research libraries, but he also states elsewhere that we desperately need appraisal theories to be developed for a new era. So to what degree can the various activist approaches in archival appraisal developed in the last half of the 20th century, or a blending of them, serve our current needs? And to what degree do we need new appraisal theories? We have only a few more minutes for discussion, but I would like to turn the mic back over to Tom and, and really to all of you. I hope some of you will have comments, as Tom may as well, about these questions that I've raised or topics I've raised and others fr from the paper. There was so much here to discuss. I feel like I need to talk for another half an hour. For, uh, <laughs> what, um, Sarah may not allow that. Right. Um, <laughs> So maybe what I would just, I don't think I can address all of that and I do want to, um, but maybe I would just say that there were two concerns that I tried, that I thought about this opportunity. One had to do with, I have this deep concern that we're not talking about appraisal anymore and that's um, um, really important. The second is, um, in my own career, yes, yeah, so I've been here at Harvard for two years. Before that I was um, director of special collections at UCLA and then my career uh, at Yale. I worked both in the Manuscripts and Archives Department and at the Meineke Library. In all four of those settings, um, I had, uh, I've had increasing interaction with people working, librarians working in a general collections framework wanting to move into acquiring things that we have traditionally done in special collections. And, um, and had great success in some areas. Um, so area, I, I think about my colleague Cesar Rodriguez, who built these incredible Latin American collections at Yale and uh, made sure we raised money together to, to process them. He led our efforts to um, connect them to researchers. Um, and that was, he had this full stewardship model. And in other contexts, I've had people who have thought, um, we should just collect something and then you take care of it as if the special collections and archives were the technical services for um, formats that you know, the general cataloging department didn't, didn't know how to handle. And within every context I worked in, there has been this holistic understanding. And increasingly, as we have problematized the idea of hidden collections, and we've said we aren't going to, you know, we've spent all of this effort to reduce them, we shouldn't create a new problem. And so that, you know, the, um, I think, you know, I wrote this title, Convergence or Collision, um, before I wrote the paper. And, I, you know, in some ways, I think I would title it differently now. But that's the collision I'm talking about in that, um, uh, so um, in where you have, in my perception, people working from one framework and just wanting to implant it onto, um, into a special collections and archives framework. So, um, yeah. So what, what makes this, the, the convergence successful? What the, 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 where, where that has worked for um, right. people outside of special collections to work with special collections and what is it you know, challenging? And so here's a few ideas. I, I think, um, and this has been, these are things that are in play. Um, I think traditional tech services in the general library, yeah, I, I think that there are, um, we need more manpower to take care of collections and I think we can do some retraining and or freeing up lines to hire people with um, more experience working with uh, rare and unique materials and archives. Um, uh, I think that we can think about some of our acquisitions budgets as being used for um, stewardship activities as well and maybe think about combining the idea of what it means to acquire something is also to make it useful. Um, so, and um, you know, I realize that collection budgets are under great demand, but. Yeah. Um, but uh, so are tech services staff in the general library. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I see your points, but I guess I, from a general collections perspective, I, I, I feel as though uh, our, our, 
the, the, the opportunities for us are expanding as well and our resources aren't. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, your points about, about needing uh, to apply some archival principles to manage that uh, um, larger universe of materials in the general collections when, where the record of scholarship is not just articles and books, but websites and digital projects and data and so forth, so. Yeah, well then maybe we need to do, so maybe we need to do less and to be more selective about what we do, right? More you collaborative. Know, right, and more collaborative, uh -huh. yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Quickly, any comments or questions for Tom? Hi, I'm Deb Bucher. I work at Vassar College, and I'm wondering about another area of convergence in uh, research and instruction. Um, it seems like there's a lot of really gifted uh, reference librarians. Um, sorry. Uh, there are a lot of gifted reference librarians who, uh, in the, in the, who, who used to <laughs> um, be really um, energized by working in the general collection. And um, I think, I, I'm just wondering how we can employ um, a, 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 a more, a better convergence between um, reference and instruction in the general collection and in special collections. Like how could we be better colleagues with, with each other? Um. Bob's given me something yeah, to think about that I wasn't thinking about it before, but um, I will, it seems to me that part of the shifts in reference and instruction, um, it is now less about how to use the library, you know, how to find things in the library, and it is more about how library resources can be used to productively support research and, um, and learning. Um, and so when we host students with their faculty at, at Houghton, you know, it's about engaging with material, you know, it's, you know, it's occasionally like, this is how you find primary source materials, but it's much more as like, this is what it's like, this is how they can be used, this is the type of work you can do with um, primary sources. Um, and the problem we have now is that we've reached our capacity both in our building and in the staff of it, you know, in order to do this. So. Um, we've experimented, you know, at, at earlier settings, you know, we would have people in the general library come in and teach with special collections. I think in past, in the past, there's been a gulf between special collections and the general collection that has been very difficult to transcend. And I think, you know, there's certainly vestiges of, of it now. I, um, I would like to see us take the pretensions out of that and to, you know, to, you know, for, for my own colleagues to welcome expertise into our midst to help us do our work and, you know, and contribute that in reciprocal ways. Hi, David Mager, Princeton University. So, yeah, that was a really great presentation. I have a question, I guess, for both of you. Um, I understand the potentials of convergence as you've described them around, you know, provision of certain kind of instructional services and um, enabling people to use special collections more effectively within the context of the kind of research and teaching that they want to do. Um, in terms of the content, I have a collection development angle on this, which, which seems, to, in my observation, to still be a kind of collision, which is, how, in this process of deciding what to acquire, and correct me if this doesn't accord with your own experience, um, special collections seem less uh, open to input from the current trajectory of teaching and research going on on the campus. The specifics of the local institutional context, both current and projected into the future, Whereas that seems to be the daily bread and butter of people developing general collections. Where are we? What are we doing on our campus now? Where are we headed? What's going to be taught or researched in the future? Both, you know, the, the owned collection and the facilitated collection. Um, and it seems to me that uh, I encounter this many times, a collision where, uh, you know, a subject librarian who's in charge of developing a piece of the general collection 
comes with a, an important idea and an opportunity to add something to the special collections that is of a tremendous interest for his or her faculty. And the uh, curators will say, yeah, but we don't collect that. Mm -hmm. their, their collection policy, if you can talk about one, is less susceptible to inputs from the current doings on campus, it seems to me. I, I think your finger is on the pulse of, I, I, so I, I agree with you. Here's what I would say about that. Um, we develop collections for both research and teaching, you know, and I think the, the basic, you know, the, the fundamentals were, special collections were research driven. And the idea was we weren't going to cover deep research in, in every area, right? So that's the, um, that's the pretense. I would say that um, my own curators would be very happy to work with, um, to add materials to the collections as long as it wasn't you know, enormously difficult. So this is where the stewardship piece comes in. Um, so if it's a volume here, you know, it's a small number of manuscripts, like that's not the issue. What the issue are is, is I've, got, um, I've got a an archival collection that's 100 linear feet and you know it's of this that um, I want you to take care you know take and steward and I don't have you know an archivist working with with the expertise to take care of that um, so this concept of shared stewardship is you know the deal that should then get made is um, sure we'll take it on but you have to you know partner with us to either find staff members to work with it to vote um, devote Time to raising money to, to take care of it. Um, um, if you know, if you're working in an area of specialization where we don't have it in special collections, you know, to do the reference, you know, the advanced reference and research. And I think that is, but that concept of shared stewardship is is a powerful one, where the reservation is that, um, to be really blunt, it's hard to do the you know for the decision to be like well okay we're going to acquire this and then you're going to do the work you know and that's the you know so that's the dynamic we need to transcend um, and and I think it's a great dynamic to, to transcend but that's the, you know that's the reservation I think from um, you know, the special collection. I know we are over time and need to conclude, but I would add just a, a bit here that at Duke I think we. We see special collections very much supporting teaching and research, just as general collections do. But we att have attempted to find those areas of research and teaching to which the university has a sustained commitment over time that's not just dependent upon a single faculty member or a particular course. And, and so the, the areas that are collected primarily within special collections do relate to those ongoing uh, areas of interest and in research. Whereas in a general collection, we can be more responsive to a single course or to a uh, single faculty member. And so as we're trying to bring those things together, we find that uh, perhaps um, having some representative items, again, with shared uh, uh, care and, and support uh, from areas in which special collections is not going to focus, um, allows, uh, allows that kind of support. But it, without taking on a greater commitment than we can really sustain. Thank you all.